and recording. So welcome, uh, it's February 13th for the OSC developers meeting. A few things here. So first let's start with um, the numbers. Okay, let me share my screen for everybody so you can follow what I'm looking at. Yeah, so if we go to the dev, dev team log, just look at some numbers. Um, gamification of the of the of the results of development is kind of happening with our hours graph so as you see we we came up a little notch if you look at February 12 here um, about 150 or so development hours that's pretty decent a little bit bit of above the week before if you compare it exactly to February 12 or 13 today it's about exactly one year from when we started a year ago, February 6, when we just started the actual formal development team. Uh, so we're, you can say we're 150 hours above that result. So if we continue going as we are, this graph over this whole year should, should increase substantially. And if you go to the leaderboard, I just want to point that out. Uh, leaderboard of all time so we see that uh, if we look at the bottom numbers here look at the the people people's hours we have one let's see from before let's see where's Ruslan here Ruslan congratulations he's achieved 120 hours there like if you see he's at number 14 of overall developers so that's our new entry to the uh, the, the one star developer we're, we're giving people stars behind their uh, developer badge to signify that they completed a full development cycle so there's Ruslan right there as far as the existing people Abe Abe is at 369.5 look at that that means three complete sessions he's just cracked that so congratulations Abe for continuing Lex Lex is above that Lex has cracked the three full development sessions uh, congratulations on that and Michael Altfield our web admin he's he's way up there he's continuing to work on a back migrating the site to a new server and all that cleaning everything up from the years of neglect and then Roberto that's really good uh, way on top so Roberto's in, in uh, second place here um, so Roberto has been continuing as a solid developer excellent guys um, let's see do we have do we have Roberto here as well who else is on our team we've got uh, yeah yeah we've got everybody here um, okay that's good uh, I want to continue on the development template from last time I, I gone I've gone briefly over the tool template so if you guys um, template GVCS header I just want to go back to that because that we can integrate that so the GVCS header I talked about last week how to access that so when you go click edit you see what's inside of that and it's actually the tool template so if you look at the tool template um, that's what generates uh, tool template I just want you guys to just play with that and see how that actually works because the next thing we can do if you know what we do is we embed all our Google Docs and we embed like the development spreadsheets but what would be good is for us to create a template where we call forth the template and the way we call it like it, calling it is very simple you just put the double brackets uh, yeah, just to give you, you know, just to give you as a sample, double brackets, because I want to show you how how much time you can save when you want to embed things on a wiki. So all you do is, for example, call the template, which is say it's going to be called the embed template, um, and then you would pass into the pass into it the parameter that you want. So for example, if we put this the ID of the say a Google spreadsheet. You can put that in there, you know, type that in there, and then double bracket, and then then click save page, and then you would have, for example, a whole. Uh, of course, this doesn't work because it's not a real template. You would have the say the the development 
uh, work document embedded with the edit link underneath it. So instead of spending, say, like a minute or two embedding each single document, you can do that with one line like that, which would take you like, you know, 15 seconds or so to copy and paste the ID of the document. And we can do the same for development templates. Uh, the actual uh, temp, which is called a template on the wiki, uh, template, development spreadsheet template. If we want to embed this whole thing on new projects, like, for example, uh, John has just done with his PVC pipe D3D, uh, that can once again be embedded with including the edit link. Like we put the edit link underneath the document, right? So that all takes time. You know, like if you look at the simple template underneath it, when you click at it, you see the whole embed with the with the second part down underneath, which is the edit. So yeah, uh, we can make better use of templates to just facilitate these processes. Um, yeah, to make it work for us. So so think about that and use that. What we do want to do definitely, like ASAP, is create a template for embedding presentations and a, and a development templates. So that's something someone can take a stab at that please go ahead okay next so let's, let's go to uh, some of the the results that we have I uh, let's start oh yeah I want to show you guys if you look at my screen so what I did to the on the digester work I've added so there's a page called open source biodigester on the wiki I've added the <coughs> heat enclosure to it um, so basically this whole thing is enclosed and the pipes are sticking out and pretty much got the bill of materials working on the bill of materials on that page but this is what it looks like right now and the heat enclosure is needed so that you keep it at about 100 Fahrenheit uh, in there and what what we're gonna do is we have a pump running from the solar thermal heater in the in the greenhouse of the CD home which will pump hot water from the it's called the hillbilly heater that just basically black tubing on the ceiling of the greenhouse which gets really hot when it's sunny we're gonna pump that into a coil of PEX tubing that's gonna just be sitting right under the the digester so that just emits the heat passively into the the whole compartment which is then insulated with this whole box so it's all hidden it's got a top cover uh, so then you retain the heat in there to keep it really warm and in the summer when it's hot out it's probably the thermal activity inside the digester might keep it warm but definitely like in spring and winter fall you need some heating to keep it very hot so that's that's uh, update on the biodigester ready to been getting some of the parts and probably ready to install if all goes well this installing this weekend and we'll see how that goes so, <clears throat> let's see, Lex, would you mind pasting a copy of that into the work document there as well? Um, yeah, and okay, so there's the digester. I'm going to just take a look at the roadmap for a second, just to organize everybody around that, uh, because we've got a bunch of goals for the year. If you think about main goal I mean the main goal is still let's get more people involved doing this work kind of work it's not sorry not roadmap I'm, I meant critical path those are two different pages there's a roadmap page which talks about all the long, longer term roadmaps and a critical path with the uh, specific ones for the the year so going into this current document just want to p point a few things so I've been working on this adding a few few details to it so I want to point out a couple of things here so on the roadmap uh, you see it got populated with a bunch of workshops towards the end of the year December like November December but the 3d printing thread which is the one right here a uh, lot of different elements in there, the filament maker, the new extruder, the PVC stable version, HeroX drill challenge to make the cordless drill, large extruder, um, and then <coughs> a few workshops, but <coughs> going towards the immersion in September. 
So still, that's yeah, that's that's a big priority. Immersion training program, six to twelve people. Uh, announcement would come out in May, uh, where people can actually start recruiting people for that, and, and acceptances would happen by July. Uh, so there's a couple of months before that. But if um, we do well at that, then then we could be running a number of workshops as a team uh, in different places around the world. So the workshops here, upper right corner, <clears throat> reflect that, okay, we've t trained some people to do run workshops, we finalized some of the products, added some good features, and now we can run stable workshops in a regular way in different places. So uh, just to detail some of the things around the 3D printer, what it's looking like. Uh, so look at that. So the things that we can do, a little small laser cutter head, 4 watt laser cutter. And the laser cutter is actually quite interesting. Um, I've been looking quite a bit at selective laser sintering. So that means you got powders, uh, powders of metal or plastic or any substance. But selective laser sintering is how people do high performance metal part 3D printing. And the, and the lasers in those machines can be as little as on the order of about 10 watts. So so just about the level of the laser for a small little laser cutter would also do for a selective laser sintering 3D printer system. So just, just a thought, but I mean, that's I've been looking into that. And if we've got laser technology down pat, then selective laser sintering means you've got a powder bed of a, of a, of a powder of a metal, any metal, from titanium to iron to whatever, stainless steel. They make powders of all of this. And by sh shooting a laser on that, you solidify it, and therefore you can 3D print parts. Uh, is that practical? Well, uh, powder of iron costs about a dollar a pound, so this is like really potentially feasible. So j just a thought, but uh, not a bad idea. So just keep that open. So filament extruder is a major part for recycling plastics, and uh, that's moving forward and we're still looking at if we talk about a workshop there might be a Seattle workshop for the extruder so uh, a couple of months before the program okay and we'll talk about other products um, drone drill camera microscope phone D3D CNC torch table yes absolutely the small extension of the D3D is the CNC torch table which we've already prototyped and we just gotta pretty much nail that finish it start cutting steel a microscope, the open flexure microscope. It's a small microscope that's also made by the Tech for Trade people, the guys who are making the filament extruder. That's Matt Rogi. Um, but that's a cool product. It's a it's a USB camera and a 3D printed laser, uh, 3, 3D printed microscope. So that's a that would be a good product. Phone, talking about Pi phone, Pi cam for camera. Those are things like a camera. You know, since we go through a lot of cameras <clears throat> doing documentation here, we, you know, so many of them, we could use like four cameras for doing time lapses during workshops. So if we have an open source camera, we can do that and make it really flexible and work for us, make it manageable and lower cost. Because uh, right now we're kind of pretty much every time we're short of camera cameras on, on any project, I would say, uh, could definitely use more time lapse cameras to take details of more aspects of a build. Um, what else? FreeCAD 3D, D3D workbench. Somewhat, Ruslan is starting on that in some way because he's already doing the frame. And Ruslan, if you can paste your result for what you got on the frame, I don't know if you've got that in the work doc. Haven't really seen it in the work doc, but if you can paste it, see what you got. Because um, you, you're working on a frame. It's made of PVC. That is... Yeah, yeah, do that so we can show off what we've got already. But, I mean, we're kind of inching along towards a full workbench in FreeCAD where we can actually uh, design a full 3D printer. If you look at my, let's see, so if you look at my screen here, uh, Stephen has already done a workbench for D3D. I mean, it's not functional, but he's already started it, and it's called... Uh, that here is that example workbench yeah no it's not not exam let's see is there one that says d3d here draft drawing fastness fem image and space mesh none open scad trace my much ship sketch spreadsheet start 
might be this nun here no no but basically what he did he already started uh, basically there's an icon for the way it would work is you would have drop down icons icons that you click on it and you drag and drop essentially a part of the printer into the working working document uh, so that's not a far cry after we've got the macro for for example the frame we can put it as a button within FreeCAD and then go from there so yeah so that's the D3D workbench starting on that another thing is uh, so another major product would be a design guide once we run workshops you want to give a full workshop manual well, that's actually different than a workshop manual. Design guide is how do you actually design a 3D printer. So some details on on how to do that. How do you make it work? What parts we use and everything. So that's something we can document at this point so that others can, can actually start understanding how to put a whole printer together. And they could start designing their own modifications. That would be good for wide ad adoption. Uh, website, that's for... That also has to be done. A remote print cluster. So think about that, though. So for 3D printing... Imagine we get an online, we can develop a, an online platform where you have a 3D printer at home and you can a allow people remotely to put in their credit card and pay you to, to run your printer from home, right? That's cool. That could apply to th uh, D3D torch table, it could apply to other machines, but the 3D printer is a good entry level thing for doing that so that uh, basically you can generate revenue from a print cluster and all that would take you is you have a printer that's ready for printing and you would have a say a webcam on it so people can actually view their print and then you have to ship it so if you can uh, kind of organize that workflow even to the point where you have automatic part harvesting for example you're gonna have a mechanism on a 3d printer where it just bumps the part off and the part is designed the way it's attached to the bed it's designed with uh, with uh, in a way that it's easy to take it off the print bed so you have to put that into the design but then you can you can have 3d print cluster with automatic part harvesting so literally you just uh, put a label on a box and ship it so I mean that's the idea that that would be good so people can get our kits get all our products in a way that's that's uh, automated okay so that's that's enough on uh, on a roadmap let me see. Let me zoom out of there. Lots of elements, but yeah, 3D printer definitely a big thing. And and the 3D printer does make sense in the sense that okay, you get to the larger machines like the the D3D CNC torch table, and we can also try to do the same kinds of carriages, plastic printed carriages with metal plates for reinforcement for larger machines like heavy duty CNC machines. That's still doable. I don't think that's going to happen with belts because belts are just just aren't de designed for heavy duty work. Like when you, if you're talking about pushing with peak loads of like a thousand pounds and stuff, and that's not belt territory. But then you'd probably need to use lead screws or just screws for the motion part. But that can be pretty much re um, reinserted into our current universal access system. Okay. One thing, just one more here, the book publishing. So I'm working on a book, making progress on that. The idea there is once that's published, we can make noise and get people excited about the whole overall vision and also get more people on a team. So that would be good. All right, moving on. So now for you guys, uh, let's hear about some of the... issues here so okay so Ruslan maybe can you uh, start with the PVC pipe or uh, or no yes okay go ahead um, uh, I, I tried to, to make uh, to automatize uh, automate to make auto to make automatical uh, creation of uh, the PVC pipe frame mm -hmm. cricket, I post a link this is basically story of a paper oh yeah yes um, it turns <laughs> out uh, not not to be a uh, very easy task or uh, the development was uh, time consuming but i s uh, store this for um, for teaching and learning purpose oh where's um, the link uh, i posted already oh it's okay in the 
Okay, yeah. Uh, please post that in a work doc whenever you. Okay. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, I got it. I got it here. P3 PVC pipe frame. I put a link to that in a table of contents. Okay, so the major findings are what? Excuse me? What are the main findings? Um, okay, I, I tried to do this work automatically, uh, but I can. Uh, my, my idea was to give the program provide to free cut uh, four dimensions for the frames including pi uh, pipe names uh, this implies pipe dimensions and uh, the name of the uh, corner part and then the macros uh, create a corresponding frame automatically mm -hmm. and adjust everything but uh, I, I don't I don't like the code, it's too much spaghetti code, it's, it's not nice, and uh, the macro is not very easy to use. Okay, well, question is, do, do we need this? Uh, well, so what's your, so I see that you, you've done a, a PVC corner frame, which is looks pretty cool, on slide number four, um, so how would you suggest it? How, so people would just d basically drag and drop a, a piece and then arrange it by hand in the actual workbench? Um, as, uh, as alternative to my macro, uh, now it, you just uh, select the pipe name. There is also a screenshot of the macro. Mm -hmm. It's working, by the way. Um, okay, yeah. And... Um, here, now you can enter the the dimensions uh, the in x y and z direction mm -hmm. and uh, then the frame will, will be created yes you you have you you just put uh, this uh, the screenshot of the macro to the document Excellent. So uh, why, why are you saying that you didn't get the, I mean, it sounds like you got the automated uh, frame creation. Uh, for, for example, if you change something, you need to recreate the frame completely. And uh, 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 I'm not sure if uh, it was time to, to spend for this little um, function. If, uh, what I would rather prefer if uh, they would uh, use some kind of uh, spe special specialized uh, work page and yeah. uh, now I'm looking for this uh, flamingo stuff for example that uh, all the um, all the placements of the pipes are not done by, by the macro but instead uh, have a references in, in um, our references to the spreadsheet or to some spreadsheet in uh, FreeCAD, if you know, there is uh, this feature, spreadsheet, uh, and you can uh, you can put them in, uh, instead of uh, putting them in just directly, you just make a reference to a cell with the spreadsheet, and then one should adjust the values within this spreadsheet and uh, the FreeCAD Okay. But the, but I I need to spend more time to integrate all the macros I have to this flamingo uh, work page. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, I am just uh, testing it how it works. But there is uh, a, a difference between uh, uh, current state of the flamingo and. Uh, the macros uh, I just made for our project. The Flamingo, they are, uh, they are not some parts like elbows 
uh, uh, very simple. It's just uh, just uh, part of curved uh, pipe. Okay. And, uh, Flamingo is uh, on a wiki from FreeCAD it says it's a set of customized FreeCAD commands and objects that help to speed up drawing of frames, pipelines, and pipelines may mainly. What is the status of that? How how well is that? Is that a workbench? It is a workbench. How is, how well developed is it? Well, we will see. If it's not good enough, well, I will improve it. If it's good enough, well, I will take what they have. I oh. already uh, fork uh, the repository. Mm -hmm. and it can create pipes. Maybe I, I can uh, Im improve a little bit something. And uh, there are also nice features like uh, rotation. Hmm. Uh, along particular uh, um, arc of of an elbow, for example, this this could be would be nice to. Uh, or you you can also e easily join an elbow and the pipe just uh, clicking on uh, both parts and then click the corresponding button in the toolbar. Okay. That's really great. Well, I mean, that is very recent work. That's just July 2017. So, yeah, no wonder I haven't, we haven't heard about this yet. Yeah, so as you see, uh, FreeCAD is developing in many different w directions. That's good. Okay. Okay, so see uh, what's... Yeah? Uh, okay, I will just uh, try to, uh, to put my macros into there's a uh, page. Yeah. Yeah, that would be that's that's great. That's that's what we need. Just build upon what's already there. Um Good. Thank you. So, let's good work. Let's continue that and uh you're also going to start looking at so you're wrapping up on this workbench here, and you're going to look at building the the D3D with a PVC frame, and starting looking at that like next week or something, or or as soon as you're uh, done with do this you part. Do you mean a real PVC frame, or uh, the the virtual PVC frame? No, uh, a real. Like you, you were interested in doing a real build. Oh, okay. Uh, probably not not the next week. Uh, March. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. So basically spend a little bit of time on working this out and then get on to the real build. And I need to find out where I can easily buy PVC pipes. And oh yeah. I will, I will... Yeah, yeah. So that would be an exercise like if you're not familiar with that, yeah, that should be very easy now. Of course in America that's very, very easy. I'm sure in Germany it will be pretty easy but what we don't know is whether you have but the expensive <laughs> no. I already uh, was looking for that. really oh like in a in a hardware store in a hard, in one hardware how store. much is a piece of pvc pipe i i saw there oh uh, five euro one one and a half meter and this is too expensive no that's that's ridiculous for um we pay for like half inch or three quarter inch PVC. I mean, it's on the order of like a dollar per ten feet, a couple of dollars for ten feet in the United States. So you might not be looking at the right, at a right kind of store. There's different kind of st uh, kinds of stores. <laughs> yes, this is a proper conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. I just want to uh, to remind that I already started the. Stuff. Okay, that's and good. If I will not find it, I will just order online. I, uh, it's just better to to see stuff before and to, to feel, to touch before buying, if it's possible. And do you have a, an idea whether the the piping dimensions are identical as the United States, or it's going to be? Uh, they should be. There, there is uh, some kind. Uh, uh, yeah. It's the standard uh, compared to European uh, okay. standards. It should not be a problem. Okay, excellent. 
Sounds good. So yeah. So for next meeting, like whatever you do, like we, uh, I pumped in all all these pictures into the work doc. You do that, please. So cause we uh, in the current working document, the current current meeting doc, so that we've got that all up front. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay. Uh, let's let's move on. I, or anything else? Uh, did you cover all that you need? Okay. Sounds good. Okay, let's move on to Roberto maybe um, on the new new extruder. Roberto, go ahead. Uh, well, um, I was busy with other things this week, so I couldn't um, I couldn't do very much about this, but I mm -hmm. I'm trying to to um, understand all the different extruders from Loosebot mm -hmm. and regarding your I was um, realizing that the, the Morse extruder mm -hmm. already has a, a hole for the filament so um, Oh yeah, I see it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I I think it's not needed another uh, uh, another cylinder or other shape for. Okay. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Um, so the idea here is there's this. I'm gonna zoom in here. So this is the more extruder. So these are like more advanced extruders like the more extruders for example designed for uh, the e3d volcano nozzle so the the large nozzle 1.2 millimeters uh, but we wanted to print rubber so the concept there is where you have the drive cog right there which drives the filament there's this little hole which constrains the filament from moving back and forth so you can print with flexible filaments and my comment on that would be a, that probably would need uh, like the in the in the flexi extruder, the Lulzbot flex, flexi extruder. So the good thing is all this has CAD files in the Lulzbot development directory. Um, what they do in a, let me zoom out, in a flexi extruder they have a, a little Teflon tube that's in that hole that I mentioned there. There's a little Teflon tube that guides the filament very tightly. I don't see it in a Morse extruder, uh, so maybe we because they don't advertise the more extruder for rubber. Uh, so we might have to include a little Teflon tube in there to guide the filament even more tightly. What they said in their email communications with Lulzbot people is that the, the Teflon tube has much less resistance than if you just 3D printed the structure. So the Teflon is better for printing. So here's the actual CAD. Uh, if we open it up, I'll show that. Is that going to let me do that? It's not letting me hide things. Oh yeah, okay, there's that, there, this hole right here. We might want to stick a Teflon tube in there for it to, to work better with rubber. So that's just one comment I would have on that. Um, and they haven't responded to my latest email and I was asking them like why why they didn't do the same kind of Teflon tube in all their their extruders uh, but this apparently doesn't have it it seems like an easy fix to make that work with rubber very reliably and the only trick here is that they have this metal plate this plate here is a the one I'm pointing to is a metal plate for holding the, the nozzle on properly We said we were gonna. That's that's a hard part for us to get. If you talk about custom cutting a little metal plate that's not 3D printed, so hopefully we can make that plastic because somehow we have to grab the nozzle. The nozzle is not hot up at that point, so it should be okay. But that's I mean that's the only question. Like if we don't do what they're doing, then we're we're hacking it and we don't know how well it's gonna work. 
idea there is that this metal piece allows for a very stiff connection of the, the whole extruder nozzle. Um, and you see here, this has got this large heater block, um, which is twice the size of regular heater blocks. This is the larger extruder, and this is, this is their 1.2 millimeter nozzle. And two, two fans. We were looking at taking off one fan so that we can put the, the height probe on this. Lulzbot uses a different way of doing height control, the bed leveling. They actually do a touch of the nozzle onto the bed for leveling. They don't have the the sensor on the extruder head. Okay, so let's yeah let's continue on that. See uh, see next week what we can do. Anything else, Roberto? Um, yeah, about the, um, the gear for this extruder, mm -hmm. um, I, it, do you know if it's the same from the, um, from the Iris extruder? From because the other, like the, like for example, same as the, the Flexi extruder? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You have to look at the... If you measure the distance, you can probably tell that. No idea, but it probably probably would be the same. Don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'd have to take measurements and see. Do they have the... Did you find the 3D printed parts for the, the gears? Um, not for the Flex extruder, no, no yet. But okay. for the Irox, Irox extruder, I, I have it. Arrow. Oh yeah, arrow. Air, arrow, arrow. Yeah, sorry. Oh uh, yeah, okay. I see. And the arrow extruder, what do they use that on? Um, Is that new? It's for... Yeah, yeah. It's, so, um, Brent has been talking for, for that in, in his last email. Oh, okay, okay. So they um, did respond. I was saying it's used for um, harder materials because it uses a, a more resistant tube for the filament. I mean, for um, 250 degrees Celsius. Oh. What do they use in the aero extruder? Um, Just I'm not metal. Sure where. Sorry. They don't use the so they went to the aero extruder, more constrained path, higher temperature materials, so like metal. Uh huh. The thing that I don't understand about that though is, okay, take the aero arrow extruder the part that's hot is by the nozzle like as soon as you enter the part that's like above um, I mean that 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 tube just reaches like if you t take a look at the flexi extruder I'm gonna zoom in on this here take a look at the flexi extruder well I mean the tube that plastic tube only reaches up to this this part where my cursor is and the hot part, this is this part is already getting cooled here. So this is by the time it gets to this plate here, it's cool. So I'm not sure why you can't use PTFE up in this part, which is not that's not going to be hot, or maybe it does still get hotter, but it, it's not. It's it can't be 250 at, at all because that would melt the plastic. So I'm just have to look into that, huh? So they're using Aero Struder. And they're using that, what they use there is metal, like metal down here and like metal at the top. Yeah, it looks like it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Are those... The filament get, get hotter. Yeah. Yeah. And then these, these yellow parts here, those are plastic? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Well, that's interesting why that plastic, it wouldn't be hot around that plastic, but it would be super hot around that little hole. Maybe like the heat travels right up the hole and 
ends up ruining the, the Teflon. Maybe that's what happens there. Are the parts available for the arrow extruder, or that's... Um... Yeah, I see. It's very well documented. Document. Okay. Wow, maybe that's what we have to do. Arrow extruder tool head. How much is that thing? They're charging 250 for that for the whole thing. That's a lot of money. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a completely different design. Yeah, both rigid and flexible filaments. Well, well, Lilzbot knows what they're doing. Maybe we gotta we gotta go straight to that. Um, did you see how much the actual the metal the metal part itself costs? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they've got you know a bunch of plastic parts around that um, the actual extruder proper. Yeah. Okay. Well, we do want to have a system that's that works well with with uh, all kinds of filaments. Now, the the issue here is though, does this work with a much larger nozzle? That's that's the other thing because we want to. I think for us, for printing large objects and really useful parts, our priority is the large large nozzle. Yeah, um, for things like if you think about rubber tracks or, or polycarbonate glazing, it's probably done done best with. I mean, definitely for the tracks with a larger nozzle. So I have to take a look at that. Okay, so let's continue looking at that and make a make a best decision on that, um, and go from there. Okay. Uh, anything else on the topic of extruders? Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's take continue looking at that and you see. Yeah, we definitely have to think about which way to go. The relevant considerations being: we want all filaments. We want the large nozzle, and we want reasonable cost all at the same time. Yeah. We'll see where we go from here. Okay, so next, next topic. Um, Jonathan, do you? Jonathan, is John here? No, John is. John, are you here? No. Um, okay, so we're we're good with um, with that. Um, Abe, you want to start on a power cube? Abe, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just working on the power cube fittings and details on that still. Um, yeah, I didn't get some updates on that. I was just having a, a bit of a bug in FreeCAD trying to get the uh, color-coded fittings in there. Um, I was also looking at how easy it should be to weld those parts in there, and that's what some of the one of the pictures there is in the uh, document is. Um, I'm hoping that that size I kind of went with what I reckon there an eight inch around around the MPT fitting because it looked like you're just using those. Uh, is that it? It's a half inch, one of the half inch ones. Hopefully, uh, with those holes around the fittings, it isn't too hard to weld. But um, and I made some other pipe sections for uh, uh, the um, one inch. It's their three quarter inch MPT, which is what uh, suggested before that that cutting sections of pipe sounds a lot cheaper, right? So. 
that's what I did there for the one inch, which um, is actually a three quarter piece of pipe, right? So um, I hope that that's that sounds like it fits the the one inch hose section lines, but hopefully that that fitting isn't too restrictive. Uh, the, the piece of pipe that way, since it's technically three quarter on the suction lines. Oh, uh, the th you're hoping that three quarter is not too restrictive. Yeah, I think it's okay. It's just a one okay. little little piece. I think it's yeah. working well with the existing one right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if that works. There's, there's five of those. So, okay. Um, yeah, let's see what was my other notes. Um, uh, and the next thing was, um, uh, yeah, I adjusted the size of the cubes. They got they got a lot shorter. Let's see what was the dimensions are there. 20, 27 and a quarter long for the large, the main cube. And uh, what did they get it down to? Just, well, I'll probably have to, might be handy to make some of them a little bit longer depending on how everything fits together because uh, since I shortened that, that um, coupling sleeve adapter between the engine and pump, it, uh, I, I think it's probably important to verify that uh, we would need to go measure the actual length of the engine and pump the total extent of that just to double check that. I, I guess we should know what it is with the sleeve, but probably need to make sure that that whole module, the engine pump, is, is the right length there. Uh, Which pump are you same. using? You're, it looks like you're using the one that's the two-stage pump. Yeah, you got the... Uh, yeah. Is that the two state. I, I thought that was the. That some of them are similar. I think that was yeah. the one from 1708. If that's wrong, let's see. Was 1708. Yeah. Let's let's look at the just the BOM real quick. Uh, Cause yeah, that's that's the two stage one, the log splitter pump, which um, never ended up using actually. Just had trouble okay. with the, it switching between the two sections. Let me see. Um, they all look pretty similar, but that that could be. Hey guys, I gotta run. Can somebody else take over on the minutes? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can someone do that? Thanks, Lex. Alright, bye. Thank you. Let's see. Um, so, Power cube that. ver. 17.08 let me see what's in that BOM there yeah it's the log splitter pump there that's I think that's what you got um, where do we update that there was seven what was the one after this there's power cube version 17.11 right or 17.10 well, there's 1710 yeah. Uh, from yeah October, November, um, and and there's different versions of that too. I think you were updating the. Uh, okay. Well, I don't know. I guess I don't know what happened with the solar version. There was a solar version and a bunch of these. Yeah, I've that's a tiny one. Yeah. Some of those are let's let's look at the. Part. Yeah, 1710 is the one you want. It's this one right here that I'm showing on the screen. It's a smaller pump. It's just shorter. Uh, but do we have any accurate renderings of that? Um, yeah, I thought, I thought we drew versions for all of those, uh, but but I don't know how accurate. That might have been the one that there was more question about accuracy. Yeah, uh, let's see. There's. See if you can... Uh, okay, Th this kind of pump, it's quite standard, and there might be some drawings online. Uh, so... The thing is probably like if you get there they all look quite similar but they have particular lengths and I and this yeah. is kind of like the short bodied one so I can measure the length out what I have back there but you should be able to let me see let's look at uh, I think I probably drew one or both of those pumps back when they were done in CAD and I think that one might have had certain Dimensions that were harder to tell from the uh, from their, their 
not really CAD, but they're measurements. But usually the extents are what matter, and, and of course the fitting sizes, which are usually standardized enough that you can tell. Um, so the total length of it is, is what's most critical. As long as Surplus Center has that listed correctly, then it should be... You got the dimensions of the of Surplus Center? Um, I think when see, I drew those pumps before, I did find information on them. Yeah, they're, use they're this. Yep. By, yep, yep. Okay, actually, basic. yeah, this one, I see it's got dimensions in the description. Use those. That That's good. That's about right. It's about five inches. Mm -hmm. And I don't know yeah, if that I includes the shaft inches. length or... It probably includes the point from the shaft all the way to the back. See that shaft is blind, so that's a different... Actually, with yeah. a blind shaft like that, we need a different um, a coupler, a shaft coupler. That's... Let's yeah. see, how... That's uh, in a BOM, that should be... You've used that one, so what... What did you use for a coupler? Let's see. Okay, Power Cube V17.10, BOM, nine spline coupling. So. Okay, so it's a purchased part. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. I thought so here's the link. Okay. Yeah. yeah the the latest one that we use that we're we're going with right now is the same as 17.10, and that should okay. be in um genealogy yeah I shortened the shaft coupler as well yeah, but I there guess it, it is. needs to be updated to match uh, that specific part for the splines and all that ok so there's more more details there um, yeah let's see one of the other I was thinking about besides some of the details on these parts need updating, but uh, the okay. Hold, hold on a second. Are... Hold on a second. Let me just ask. I'm looking at the genealogy. I'm looking Paracube version 18.01. It looks like. Uh, how come the development spreadsheet that's embedded in there? Because this is important for records. Because because I'm on page 18.01. And I see the development worksheet spreadsheet, and it says PowerCube 1711 on that one. Is that uh, um, same as 1711? Because it yeah, can't be the same as 1711. I probably, yeah, I probably copied the data. Uh, and that that's the template. It's um, been copied, so that probably needs to be updated. Some of the files were named. Uh, almost all the files were named 1711. Uh, Right, so you make a did you make a copy of it? You got to make a copy and change uh, the change the title. So that's this should be yeah 18.01. Template probably just cop got copied in the wiki. So yeah, renamed it. It's okay, so I just renamed it. Okay, no, that's that's good. We just you just gotta make sure those uh, naming things. Um, genealogy has to be correct so we yeah. can put stuff into the right places so okay yeah I think let's see I got some of the names approved on the see the power cube library page has quite a bit of that I think the names have been adjusted there okay although there's still there's still a lot of inner mixed parts between a lot of these yeah, I mean, they're going to be primarily the same parts, but the critical part is to to know that they're not going to be all the same, and it, and it matters that those little details are updated in each version, as each version is essentially a fork. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what... Um, okay, so what... Yeah, so Let's I see, did... so 17.10, that's good. 17.11... Okay, that's still appearing as 17. A lot of those files, the, the bombs and stuff all need to be created and updated there. Okay, looks like you've got the identical, 
Okay, yeah, if you can clean up, I'm, I'm looking at 17.11 and 18.01. Looks like you just embedded the identical thing into both of those spreadsheets. They can be, they gotta make a copy of one into the next. Do, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, just fix yeah I probably just edited the pages a little, I think. Um, okay. Um, yeah, maybe you can do that. Do that later. What was the other thing you mentioned? Okay, so the other notes I was expecting to get to some of the logistics of the mounting the power cubes and all that because that's mm -hmm. uh, the important for yeah. getting these lined on the tractor, and that will determine a bunch of the details. Uh, I'm hoping to adjust the the shape of the frame of the power cubes too much more. Uh, but they might need to be a little longer for accessibility. So, so yeah, I started looking at the live track and how to put those on there. And we were talking about a rail or uh, some sort of bracket system for that. Yeah. Um, and looking at that live track, there's, um, yeah, the current design of that, there's the tube at the back there's quite a bit of stuff in the way there too so i'm wondering actually that's something i was going to check was how heavy uh some of these existing power cubes are how hard is it to lift a um, large power cube up i guess for two people yeah um, that's uh... pretty high i, I mean they should be fairly light as far as the frame but so right end, so. you can get like this uh, yeah they're i mean they're heavy it's typically a kind of thing you want to do with uh with a hoist with two people you can do it um but yeah it's yeah. it's it's kind of hoist territory yeah okay so yeah almost have it another small tractor helps to get it up there almost yeah okay so something you can lift it with um yeah that kind of makes them a little bit less modular that's kind of what i was thinking about but yeah the small one yeah i mean obviously the small one should be doable by one person but the larger one it's just harder much harder because the small yeah. one you can actually large large part of it is actually where you can grab it in a, in a solid way the small one is small enough that it's actually quite easy to grab and it'll be about still i mean it's heavy it's probably like 200 pounds or so whereas the the one with a full tank would be like more like 300 pounds which is less one person territory but 200 is the limit kind of like of one person territory yeah and i guess a lot of the concern too is stacking these up it may make it difficult to access um i'm, I'm just going to design a top for the smaller one and of course i don't think that the larger cube uh needs a top other than it doesn't really need a six side i don't think but since it goes on top uh, hopefully i don't need any protective i mean, we could put something across it to give it more strength but since it's on top all it's the sixth side is basically just the top of the tank um we need to add more to that as well but on the smaller ones putting stacking these up uh, it's going to make it hard to access the fuel and you know, obviously they need yeah. to be at least refueled all the time. All that the basic stuff. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to design the uh, a top and it maybe adjust the bottoms for a little bit more accessibility on that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah, we should. Um, yeah, there's some details there. Let's uh, and it's it's kind of non-trivial because we have to make it all all work. Uh, you want to meet on this maybe like Thursday evening? That's there's some details we got to go over. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be good. Yeah, let's do that. So maybe uh, okay. save that for then, because it does get tricky as far as all the plumbing, and you got to fill the gas and everything else, and then there's so many of them, uh, and they're somewhat difficult to move into place. So there's a number of considerations we need to make sure are addressed. Um, yeah. And do we have... Um, Let's see, I was looking, I, I don't see a MicroTrack genealogy page on the wiki. I think we have to start that. I just kind of started that. Um, 
Yeah, because this is now the, th what is it, like the third or so micro track that we're doing. Um, and that one was 17.10. Is that it? Yeah. 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 Yep. And then See, live uh, tractor genealogy. Seventeen point one zero. Okay. Yeah. We need to do. Let's see. What do we call the last tractor? It's that was seven. Um, the one that we're. Yeah, what is that called? The, the, the big large, one? Yeah. The live track, I think it's. it's uh, uh, what is it? LT7? Was it 1711? I think so. It might have been. LT was what we were calling that. Um. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, no, I think that's in there already. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, yeah, live truck. Oh man, and I also noticed that I called it live track 17.10. Yeah, but it's really V17.10, that's correct. Okay. Wow. Yep, yep. Oh, let me change this to put the little V. Yeah, so let's always use like V17.10. So that we yeah. know. Okay. Okay. I think, um, yeah, there's a b bunch of issues we got to go over on that. So, but the live track genealogy is there. Micro track genealogy there is started. Power cube genealogy is good. Uh, so, yeah, as we go forward, I mean, it uh, gets more and more important to keep track of everything properly. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Let's see, anything else to cover for now, or can we save that for th uh, Thursday? That's mostly it. If you need Thursday, that's good. Um, mm -hmm. There are some details, I think, to measure on that. Uh, let's see, we talked before about that fitting. I think that you said there was still some... One thing you maybe need to be checked was the uh, this part, if you see my screen. Um, uh, I, I adjusted the length and, and so on on this, but the, the sleeve coupler that goes between the engine and the pump, mm -hmm. uh, four bolt pattern there, it's yeah. square in the photo, of course, you showed, and I think you said that that, that, was, uh, that needed to be measured and, and checked, so um, if we get measurements on that, and maybe the... On what, the length? The length, um, the length was 2.5, is what you said before, and, or no, 3. Three. The diameter was 2.5, so the, the diameter of this pipe was, the OD of the pipe, I assume, was 2.5, right? So, um, but the, the, the shape of the ball hole pattern, I think, was in question, is what you suggested. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the engine side. So that, that was one thing that we probably need to get right. Yeah, we need to get the engine, the that, bolt pattern. That part will be CNC cut, I assume. Mm-hmm, yeah. The southern... Uh, so they, they can all pull be CNC cut probably to a different shape to reduce waste there. Um, so, yeah. And the total length, actually, if you can measure the total length of the engine to that pump, then we'll know uh, from the front of the engine to the back of the pump, too. That, that would probably be good to verify. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll, I can do that. I'll measure that out today. And this file, you haven't uploaded that yet? Because I see I just downloaded this one. That's Yeah, I was about to upload this. And, and okay. I'm having some kind of strange bug here where uh, I was putting these fittings in here and color-coded fittings. And for some reason, when I'm trying to construct my new fittings in here, it's moving all the other fittings around. So I, I um, don't know. I'm have are to they? Work that out in FreeCAD. Are they copies? Because uh, one thing I found that was troublesome when I made... When I just copy and paste it, it doesn't work. It, what works is doing clone and yeah. And so draft. I use, I have one I guess copy that I in, I uh, no I merge uh, the component in from another file and mm -hmm. then uh, I make clones of that. So mm -hmm. um, it's 
some, something to do with the constraint system because I got a lot of constraints on these these things. I have mm-hmm. the blue ones up above for the returns, and I'm trying to put these red ones up below. Anyway, it's, it just moves them all around when I'm trying to constrain. So there's there's a little bug there, but I'll mm-hmm. I'll figure out some way to do that. I've tried a couple of ways to do that. It, it's different each time, but yeah, yeah upload the file. I can uh, see. See if I do get the same thing. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. Okay, thank you. So we'll talk. Uh, can you do 6 p.m. on, on thir- CST on Thursday? Yeah, that, that would work for me. Okay, let's do that. Uh, sounds good. Okay, let's go next to Herman. Hello, hello. Um, uh, reports from Australia. <laughs> yes, uh, I don't have I don't have a lot to say, but I do have a couple of things. Um, if you look at the slides there, um, I just printed the first uh, few pieces. Nice. The, and uh, they are not the most beautiful pieces that I have seen so far, but. Um, all the dimensions are correct. Nice. Uh, and um, the machine is now performing. Uh, so there is. Um, it's constant in the in the in the prints. Uh, there haven't been variations or or anything to worry about. It. Um, uh, I think the problem I was having with the squash. Uh, bottom layers. Mm-hmm. Um, I cannot tell a hundred percent sure because what happened is um, I changed the acceleration for the Z uh, axis uh, on uh, in Mali. I move it from uh, one hundred that was set up to one thousand, um, and uh, that I believe was the solution. For some reason, the, the lowest value of acceleration was not getting the the z axis to move quick enough hmm. um, in the first few lines. Um, but at the same time, I have an issue that um, OSC Linux I have it installed in the hard drive in a laptop, and um, it asked me to update the software, and I could update. And something that happened is that it updated uh, Jira, and uh, it sent me back to a standard Jira version. Mm-hmm. So I have to go and re- reinstall the Lulzbot version, and uh, that came with a different uh, start G code. So at the end of the day, I don't know, I'm not sure what improved, what fixed the prints. It was just the um, the acceleration correction on the z-axis, or whether it was a, a start G code that was somehow generating an issue. Um, I have simplified the start G code now, um, and uh, that is working at the moment. Um, another thing is. Uh, uh, I have changed in Marlin. Uh, I have changed the bed leveling uh, to uh, what is called um, bilinear. Okay. Uh, because I couldn't, when I print the last set of parts, the, uh, the well, when I, I printed the, the uh, a whole set of uh, short, short idler side, and I printed. Uh, half a set of uh, the motor uh, side for the universal axis and uh, I was having troubles with the leveling of the bed because the nozzle will um, um, with a three point probing the nozzle will be rubbing on one spot and being being correct at some point and, and rubbing on another point and if I rise it, of course, it will be okay in the, 
place where he was rubbing before, but it will be too high and loose and um, addition uh, in the other place. So I try with the uh, first with the um, with the linear bit leveling, mm -hmm. and that didn't work. And then I went to B linear. I commented out the enable leveling fade height. I commented that out, and I activated uh, what is called the bilinear subdivision. And with that, uh, it did just a perfect job. Um, hmm. It took nine points. It took nine points. Okay, it broke the bed in nine points. And uh, it was just the, the, the first layer was pretty much perfect all across. Hmm. That's um, interesting. Um, no, yeah. Let me see. Um, okay, so you've documented it all on, on your further details. Yeah, I need to add some more comments there in relation to the... Huh. That's, yeah, once again, I don't know what's going on there because the, the three-point is working, has always worked here, and that's all ever needed to use. Uh, but for some reason, the bilinear, just uh, nine-point probing just worked for you. Yeah, the linear, the linear also does a nine-point probing, but um, what the bilinear does, apparently, without all extra correction for yeah. the... Is, is hmm. it creates like a like a vir virtual plane uh, that is a more um, it makes more extrapolation between the points. It adds, adds values between the points, I think, or something like that. So it creates a more accurate plane. Um, yeah, it's a more accurate plane. And does does your bed look like it's to begin with quite quite straight or? I, I checked my bed before I installed it, uh, and it was pretty much flat, but mm -hmm. uh, zero, zero bent anyway. But mm. when I put the PEI plate on top, I think the PEI plate has a bit of cooling on it. Mm. Uh, because you can see the, 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 the corners of the PEI plate uh, bending up. So I think the, okay. um, it may be pulling uh, on, on the bed. Okay, there could be some issues there. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, all I know is that, from what I understand about Marlin, is that it doesn't, it gets you a flat plane correction. It actually doesn't correct for mountains and valleys. It, it gets, it makes believe the, the bed is all one plane. So that's, yeah, yeah. that's, that's something that if we have larger print surfaces, that's just not going to work because you're going to have enough variation that you have to trace the mountains and valleys in a, in a bed. But I'm wondering if um, if it's just like the your PEI coming up too much or or those different algorithms are so different. I mean, apparently those different algorithms do produce significantly different results and that one works and one doesn't so it probably is that your bed might be just enough enough in, off in terms of quality control that you need the the other leveling to perhaps do a better job but yeah we just haven't uh haven't run into any of those issues here with you know dozens of printers so um yeah. interesting yeah, but you've got that documented really on your log, so that's that's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The problem arises when I, I went too wide on the. If you look at the on the slides here, the first picture, uh, you can see that the it, it occupies a fair bit of the bed that that print, and the variation was from like in a diagonal from one corner to another. Um, uh, so obviously. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe the the you know, the three point probing was not ideal. Maybe I, sh I could have inverted the, the, the probing position um, 
to, to give it a, a chance to do it to a different equation or whatever but um, I just um, I, I just went for that option the linear there and, and it, it worked so I will print another set today and see how it goes mm -hmm. and um, the idea is to finish printing all the, the parts for a new printer and, uh, and yeah. that will probably be the last thing I will print here because um, I have only two weeks left over here in Australia um, so I need to figure out what I am going to do with this machine and um, yeah moving moving to going to Germany joining the rest of the team in Germany <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right um, <laughs> Currently, you're doing bilinear. That's what's working for you. Yeah, bilinear and with the um, what is called um, a bilinear subdivision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think this kind of issue, like as we go further down a road, what this bed leveling issue since the different and different leveling schemes work differently the end goal is probably the the bed leveling that that follows a nonlinear surface it doesn't assume the surface is linear it assumes there's mountains and valleys and but that's as far as i know not in the code currently so that's a that's a coding job that has to be um added to this to marlin sometime in the future um, and I don't think anybody is working on that. I haven't seen, well, I'm sure the larger printers, they might have solved that by doing coding that's, that follows the mountains and valleys, the actual nonlinear correction, not just the linear correction. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's definitely something for the future that as we go forward, something to address fully. Cause yeah, if you're having trouble. Uh, other people might have trouble with this as well. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Um, another thing maybe worth to mention is the, the motor for the Z-axis. It's very hot. Yeah. Um, currently running at... Um, what I did is I, I did a check of the motors by just... Uh, not with the voltmeter, but just adjusting the, the, the potentiometer and until the motor stopped and then sort of find the place where the motor did, uh, made less noise mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, for all the motors and for example x and y are working at very low currents uh, very low voltage like 0 0.35 mm -hmm. um, but the z axis um, to get it to its like a sweet spot with with the noise was 0 0.9 volts, uh -huh. uh, but that was boiling, so um, I brought it back to 0 0.8. Mm -hmm. And still, it is working correct, uh, okay, but um, um, it's, it's just getting too hot. I don't have the thermometer here to measure it at the moment, but I would say it's, it's around about 70 or 80 degrees. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would I would say that that's around about the temperature. Um, I um, I did have the X and Y a little bit low to start with uh, at 0 0.25, and I did a, I got a bit of uh, skipping. Happening. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, no, the, the the geometry all of what it is I did all the machine is assembled um, with pretty low tolerance um, all the axes everything is pretty square and mm -hmm. just going back to the issue with the bed and the bed itself is also pretty square with with the travel of x and y and of course there is a little bit of drooping but towards the front towards uh, uh, y uh, sort of along y mm -hmm. as, as because of the design uh, but it's not is nothing uh, crazy. You can see there in the in the picture underneath 
um, it's not really clear. There are all the pictures on the P3D uh, wiki, uh, but mm -hmm. I put like a ring, a frame around the short adder uh, on the carriage was it, and uh, that keeps that keeps the bait from drooping. What did you use there? What's right? Sorry, what did you use there to keep it from drooping? Uh, it's like a, yeah, like a small frame that I printed um, that fits around the short idler bit that holds the bit. I see. And, and that keeps keeps the, the sandwich from opening at the, at the back and letting the bit droop. I see. Uh, that was uh, I wasn't planning that on a on a permanent fix. I just did it to to get out of the um, to see if it, it made a uh, if it improved anything. And, and it did. It's it's, uh, it's keeping everything pretty square. Okay. There is no heat transmission to to the to the rods whatsoever. Uh, um, they are pretty cold all the time. Uh, with the bed running at 50, 50 degrees. Okay. That's good. And that question I had was in relation to um, the um, um, software updates. Um, mm -hmm. Are we, are we meant to update the, let's say, uh, I was working the other day and um, uh, I have the Linux installed in a laptop and it prompt, prompted me to install updates and when I did, uh, Curia was updated. Hmm. Um, are we meant to keep running with uh, the versions that are uh, pre-installed pre with the OS E Linux or are we meant to... Uh, update software. No, uh, no, don't Google. don't update it. Use okay. OSD Linux. Just maybe go back to it, reinstall it. Yep. Yeah. Because we don't know what's going to happen if you update it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you, like you saw. Okay. Well, I tell you what happened to uh, Cura. Basically, what happens is what happened is that um, uh, I got the it, it updated itself to a standard version. Yeah, Most yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I have to find the loose bot version to put back in the computer. And I ended up not finding the same version that we had in the OEC Linux. So I installed the, uh, I, it's written there in the D3D Australia uh, wiki, uh, is version, uh, version 2.66 or whatever. Yeah, 2.666. Right. Um, uh, it works fine. It's, it's, um, it demands a bit more memory in the computer. Right. We we typically just say yeah, just use the OSE Linux because it's got all the right settings and like it should be. But since you've already changed some of the settings, that's uh, uh, yeah, you're kind of going off. But what's the easiest thing for you right now? You just leave that one. Just leave it because it works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah. if it works, just leave it. Yeah, that sounds I will, good. I will write down. I will write down all the settings uh, on the wiki day just to make sure that it's recorded um, um, for reference uh, for myself and, and uh, just in case we, we want to check anything. But, um, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So you continue, you'll continue printing, see how it w continues to work. That's a good, uh, yeah. good data point. Okay. Well, that sounds good. So, yeah, thank you. So let's move on here. Uh, let's see, anything else? Thing that covers what we have for today. And as far as questions and comments, Software updates for OSE Linux. No, that's from last time. Any other questions or comments, or we're good for now?
Okay. Well, let's keep going then. So um, that's that will do it for today's meeting then. So thank you, everybody. And we will talk same time, so once again, 2 p.m. CST next Tuesday. Thanks a lot. Okay, see ya. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye.